2 Peter chapter number 1. I'm going to warn you before we start, I'm a little bit um, nervous about this, and I think you'll understand why. Um, this is one of those uh, Bible studies that I don't know if a uh, pastor is going to put this up online, um, and I think you'll understand why. Not, not that it's going to be tough, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be red meat in the sense that you may be thinking, um, but it's, it's more of an advanced um, Bible study, and there are some people that probably shouldn't listen to this. I know that sounds bad, um, and I'm going to get this out of the way now um, before we even read the text. If you don't believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, you have no business listening to this sermon. Because, because this will cause greater confusion. If you do believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, but don't know why, you have no business listening to this sermon. Because it will cause greater confusion. I'm going to address some of the things. Uh, the title of the Bible study is The Dangers of Being King James Only. Um, now, I'm King James Only. Always will be. It's something we're going to die over. There's no, there's no question about it. However, there are what would be perceived as weaknesses to the King James Only movement, if you want to call it that, the doctrine. And I'm going to address some of those this morning. Um, in a church like this, if you're coming to an adult Bible study, I assume you do believe the King James Bible to the Word of God. If you're coming faithfully to an adult Bible study on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m., you've heard plenty of sermons on why the King James Bible is the Word of God. So if you don't know why it's the Word of God, 98% chance it's your fault that you don't know. You weren't, you weren't paying attention, you didn't listen, you're stupid, you missed that sermon. I don't know what the reasons are, but if you've been coming for any length of time to a church like this, you should know why the King James Bible is the Word of God. If this does end up going online and you don't believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, or you don't know why you believe it's the Word of God, you need to turn this off and go find out why it is first. Because again, this will cause confusion. However, if you know why you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, then this will, I believe, strengthen you and answer maybe some questions that you don't know, uh, but we'll get into it. Second Peter chapter number one, verse. but I wanted to start with that because like I said, this is not for someone that does not, I am not, my objective this morning is not to convince you that the King James Bible is the word of God. It's not my objective. I hope that you already are at that point because otherwise the rest of this will mean nothing and it will rather confuse you, which is why, as we're gonna talk in a little bit, why a lot of people don't discuss the things I'm gonna discuss this morning. Because if you don't have that basis, you, this isn't going to make sense or it will further confuse you. Does that make sense? I'm, 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 and again, I know that can come across a little condescending and I don't mean it that way. Um, but it can also be a compliment because I'm teaching it because I believe most of you will get it or should be able to get it. And so I, I don't mean that as condescending. I mean it as a compliment because this church, you should know why the King James Bible is the Word of God. And this should... Um, help clear up some things that are coming up now in 2023, causing problems. Second Peter chapter number two and verse number, or uh, I'm sorry, Second Peter one, verse number 19. The Bible says we also we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises in your hearts. Now, if you know anything about the Bible and the, especially in the Psalms. The, the word of God is a light into our path, right? That is how we light our path. The only way we know which way we're going is through the word of God. And it's very interesting that the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Written here in 2 Peter, the readers of 2 Peter at this time had more of the Bible than the people did in the Old Testament. So you know what? They had a more sure word of prophecy because they didn't have just Genesis, they didn't have just Exodus. They didn't have just the Old Testament. They were accumulating the New Testament. And if you were here for the loyalty meeting, that uh, sermon that uh, Brother Hudson preached on um, Job, that was an important, that, that kind of ties into this because Job didn't even have all the scripture and he still lived for God. You and I have all of the scripture in our lap accumulated into one book. We should be more sure and more sound on some doctrines than even some Bible time saints were. Because we have the Word of God. We have the completed Word of God. And that's what I want to use as a springboard to talk about it. A few verses we're going to read before we get into it. And the next three, four verses I'm going to read, including the one we just read, you have to believe these verses for anything I go through the rest of the Bible study to make any sense. If any of these doctrines that I'm going to read these verses from, and again, each one of these could turn into its own Bible study. Each one of these could turn into its own sermon. 
But I want to set the basis because if, you, if any of these next four verses don't check off, then the rest of what we're going to go through is pointless. Again, I want to iterate. It's a, it's a um, you have to, you, you build a house, you start with the foundation. If the foundation's weak, the house is going to crumble. And, and so what I'm going to talk about now is the foundational issues of being King James only. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So what you have to believe is that the word of God is not only settled in heaven, but always has been. Amen. So the word of God, when you get to heaven, you're going to see the word of God in its completed form. Now, the word of God has not always been on earth. It just wasn't. There, but what God did over a course of time, through holy men of God that were moved to the Holy Spirit, he progressively revealed the word of God to man to where we are today that we have a completed full word of God. So the, you and I have the completed word of God. Adam didn't have it. Moses didn't have it. Matthew didn't have it. But we have it now. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Well, guess what? This has always been settled in heaven. And we have it now. So you have to understand the fact that the word of God has always existed. It didn't just, God wasn't at, you know, 500 BC going, mm, let me, I better, I better hurry up and finish writing this. You know, they're going to need more of this. I better, I better figure out what I'm going to write next. No, it wasn't something haphazard. It always existed in heaven and it just gradually was revealed to man on earth. Matthew, uh, or 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So if we believe the word of God has always existed in heaven and we believe that the word of God has to be somewhere on earth, God has to give you the word of God that you need, right? And it's completed now and we have it on earth. If we believe that, and again, I'm going to come under the assumption that we all believe that, then we have to agree, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So if we agree and we're all, and I'm taking the assumption we're all King James only this morning, if we all agree that this is scripture, we have to agree that all of this came by inspiration. All right? Now, with, when studying uh, why the King James Bible is the Word of God, sometimes you've got to start from the end and go back to the beginning. Because we agree the Bible has always existed. And so we have to come under the assumption that every single jot and tittle, every single word, letter in this book is the inspired Word of God. Now we can sit here and argue all day, and this is what the critics do. That, well, that shouldn't be in there. That, this is an error. This is that. We all have come to the assumption, hopefully this morning, that we already believe this is the Word of God. So if it's in here, I'm not going to criticize why it's in there. I'm going to say, okay, it's in there, it's the Word of God. That must have been part of God's plan. And when I see that it's in there, I said, well, I don't know why God chose that plan to get it in there, but it's in there, so I know it's part of God's plan. Does that make sense? And that's, you have to understand that as we go through that. The third verse is this, for ver uh, Matthew 5.18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass away, one jot or one tittle in no wise shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That means every jot and tittle. Now, not to get into a further Bible study this morning, but a jot is just what you think it is. It's a jot. It's the I. It's, it, the jot and tittle are Hebrew, Hebrew characters, if you will, or even smaller than characters in the Hebrew language. But the jot is pretty much the, uh, the dot over the I, and the tittle is equivalent to the crossing your T. And the Bible says that not... One of those will pass from the law to all has been fulfilled. That means every single, not even letter in the Bible, but every portion of the letter is important. And that is true. And you have to understand that as we go through this Bible study. Because there's a lot of King James only guys that say they're, they're King James only. They don't believe that. They'll say they believe it. And they'll say it to win an argument. But it has, if you believe it, it has to be true all the way through. All the way. And again, this is why it's dangerous to, I don't want to say dangerous, but it's hazardous to say this to new people that don't understand the doctrine of being King James only because it can turn into confusion. And I don't want it to do that. But again, I'm hoping that everyone here this morning and anybody listening to this already understands that everything in this word of God is there for a reason. Everything in the King James Bible is there for a reason. Luke 16, 17 says this, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than that one tittle of the law shall fail. So again, heaven's not going anywhere. We know that. So guess what? One tittle, one part of a letter in your Bible cannot change or else it's all garbage. I know that sounds crazy, but if one word is wrong, what, why can I trust the rest of it? 
And so we have to come under that assumption that it's all there for a reason. I have the Word of God in front of me. I don't have it, and we'll get into this maybe a little later if we have time. I don't have a translation of the Word of God. And this is a very dangerous thing. I have the Word of God. Amen. Words matter. And a lot of independent fundamental Baptists say, well, we have the best translation of the Word of God. No, I have the Word of God. Amen. I don't have a translation of the Word of God. I have the Word of God. Because the problem is, as we're going to get into in a little bit, when you start saying, I have a translation of the Word of God, what you're saying is some obscure thing I don't have in front of me is the Word of God, and I have a translation of that. No, I have the Word of God in front of me. And that's important. That's very important. And words matter. When you hear somebody say, oh, well, I believe the King James Bible is the best translation. No. And I even get worried when I hear someone say it's the only translation. Because it's not just a translation. It is the completed work of the Word of God in its completion. And by the way, I don't care what anybody says. You have to believe that statement or else you're not King James only. I don't care what anybody says. You have to believe that statement or else you're not truly King James only. And you'll understand in a little bit. Last verse and we'll get into, um, get into it. Revelation 22 says, For I testify unto you, every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from things which are written in this book. You cannot find a more clear passage in the Bible about God literally and you can, I'm not, we're not going to get into a different Bible study about eternal security. Obviously, we believe in eternal security this morning. But if you're taking things in and out of the Bible, you're not saved. Amen. All right? And God makes it pretty clear. The most, I think the most clear passage in the Bible about somebody that is not saved is somebody that is adding and subtracting from the Word of God. So we have to understand that the King James Bible is the Word of God. The one you have in front of you is the inspired Word. And it's important that it's inspired. Beware of people that say it's the preserved Word of God and not the inspired Word of God. It is the preserved Word of God, but it's also inspired. And people that are afraid to say it's inspired are usually hiding something deeper that they don't want to admit. All right? Again, I could do 12 Bible studies on this, but I'm trying to condense as much as I can into one. And we're running out of time. All right. Most um, King James only people that say they're King James only are really KJV preferred. They use the King James. They say it's the best translation. They'll always use it. They'll always stick by it. But they're not, gonna, they're, they're, they're not willing to die by it. And, and you're going to understand that in a little bit. The reason, one of the reasons I'm doing this uh, Bible study is I recently uh, saw a video. Uh, someone sent me a pastor uh, somewhere down south. He, he, based on the video I saw, about a 20-minute video, I think it was, 25-minute video, he was raised King James only. And he was fired from his church. They didn't have Baptists on the sign, so the church wasn't, I don't know if it was still independent fundamental Baptist, but it still had some independent fundamental Baptists to it, because the church fired him, and he was complaining about it in the video, and he was giving his explanation um, that he was fired because all he said was that the king, that in two pa I forget the passages off the top of my head, but he said in two passages, the NIV translated better than the King James. And the church had enough sense to fire him. Amen. After 12 years, they just, they canned him. Which, by the way, is the proper thing to do. If anybody stands behind this pulpit, I don't care who they are, I don't care what their last name is, if they start questioning the King James, you're out. All right, there, there, there's, no, there's no grace period with that, all right? We don't, we don't, oh, well, maybe you should further explain yourself. There is no further explanation. Anybody stands up here and criticizes the King James, you're out. I'm, that's, that's end of story. And so he was complaining about that. And as he began to talk, he, he knew the lingo. And again, he, he wasn't a, the Baptist wasn't on the church sign, but the way he was talking, I could tell he went to an independent fundamental Baptist college. And he started, um, he pulled out a bunch of books that he had read. He pulled out, um, this is, a, by the way, if you don't believe the King James Bible is the word of God, I don't know why you believe this is a very good book to help you understand it. Two things that are different cannot be the same. Now, a lot of independent fundamental Baptist, King James only guys that say this, only believe it so far. But, this is a very good book that will help you understand. There's all, other good books he brought up were uh, Gail Replinger's book, um, a New Age Bible Versions, The Final Authority by Bill Grady. He, he popped up a few other, and he was criticizing. He goes, I was trained on these, and I read these, but I've come to the conclusion now. And the Bible, the Bible said we're going to go through, he listed a lot of things we're going to discuss today. He's like, well, you know, they didn't address this, and they didn't address that. And, and he had some valid points, because a lot of it wasn't addressed, but... 
he wasn't sincere. And I will say this, of the, of the objections I'm going to bring up today, if you ever encounter somebody that's bringing up these objections to you, my advice to you is walk away, don't argue with them. Because I've never, in my time discussing this with people, met someone that brings up these arguments that was sincere. They bring up these arguments as a gotcha. They bring up these arguments as a, they're trying to sow division. They honestly don't believe it. They're just trying to cause problems. So it's a waste of your time. Now, if you know the facts, you can win. But you'll never win them over, from my experience. Because they, because they don't have a desire to win. It's kind of like the person, oh, what? you know, you go out soul winning and someone's going, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Or can God build a rock so big that he can't carry it? Now, you can sit there for three hours and argue with that person, but that person has no desire to learn the word of God. What they're trying to do to you is stump you. What they're trying to do is, oh, see, you can't answer. So see, your God's not real. All these things I'm going to mention this morning are brought up by people who have that same attitude. They don't have a desire to know the word of God. They're having a desire to find a way out of following God's word. They bring these up as a gotcha to try and get you. And I'm telling you, even if you win the argument, you've wasted your time. I'm doing this for you because I've seen people that I grew up with, people that I've known, preachers I've known since I was a young boy, that are now claiming, oh, I discovered this, and I didn't know that before, and now I'm not King James only. And by and large, they're lying. A few of them may be deceived, but I'm telling you, they're lying. They use these arguments as an excuse to get out and change and go where the money's at maybe, but these are their arguments for it. And I want to dispel them this morning, that way you have no excuse, all right? Now, one of the arguments they'll make is that, well, that King James onlyism is a new doctrine. And you will, you beware of new doctrines, period. All right, you should always beware, not saying that they're not true all the time, but you should beware of them because you want to stick with something that's been around for a long time, that saints have believed for a long time. I will concede to this. The King James Bible only doctrine, if you want to call it that, is relatively new. And here's why. Because for 400 years from 1600 until 1900, we only had the King James. We didn't have to believe in King James onlyism because it was the only one. So obviously it's a new doctrine. So it's a stupid argument because, well, of course it's new. Before 1901, we didn't have anything else. There was no reason for a preacher to get up behind the pulpit and go, you know, you better only be using the King James. That's all we had. We didn't have anything else to use. It wasn't like someone was writing their own. Well, maybe they were. I don't know. Thomas Jefferson was, right? But, but everyone was reading Revelation and these other verses we read. So it was a common thing. Well, if someone's adding or subtracting from the word of God, well, we're just going to totally discard them. But preachers didn't have to go around and go, you better be using the King James. You better be using the King. Because they didn't have to. There was nothing else. So this doctrine, if you want to call it that, is relatively new. Only 100 years old. 100 20 years old, 123, whatever you want to call it, right? So what, another thing they like to say is, well, they'll take people like John O. Rice and people from earlier in the century. John o. Rice don't started preaching in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And they say, well, he didn't believe in the King James Bible onlyism. Well, that's partially true, but you have to understand, because that was a newer doctrine, a lot of those old-time preachers that were solid weren't solidified on it yet because they just didn't know yet. They were still gathering information on it. So I'm not going to hold it against somebody. The, you know, the first tr perversion came out in 1901. It didn't gain traction until 20, 30 years later. So these guys that I believe were good, godly men of God were now presented with an issue and they were still getting their traction and figuring out what it is. I'll give you an example. Remember when COVID first hit? All right, don't, don't tune, tone out on me now that I mentioned COVID, all right? Because it's coming back. You better be careful. But remember the first couple, and by the way, we never canceled church. We never, uh, we never had, we never, even when the CDC said don't gather, we still gather, we still had church, right? But if you remember, if you were here the first couple weeks, we were a little cautious because we didn't know. It was like, you know, everyone, you know, I don't know, people are dropping dead. You see videos from China, people are whatever. And the first couple weeks, if you remember, we were opening doors everywhere. We were making sure we were dispersed, right? We didn't cancel church because we're still going to follow God. And we said, you know what? And I know some very big churches in America that, to their credit, they never closed. And what they did is they had um, different services at different times so they could meet in smaller groups. There's nothing unscriptural about that. And guess what? At that point in the pandemic, pandemic, whatever you're going to call it, you didn't know what was going on. Well, guess what? After about two, three weeks, we're all like, yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is stupid. We all pretty much like, all right. At the beginning, you're like, I don't know, maybe it could be, you know. After like two, three weeks of that, you're like, yeah, no. All right. And guess what? We just said, all right, forget it. We all came to church normal. 
Well, guess what? I'm not going to hold it against us at the beginning because we didn't know. We were still kind of feeling the water. Say, what is this? Well, those early saints in the early 19th century, when they were presented with perversions, like, I don't know, maybe. We've never presented with this before. And guess what? After time went on, you realize that, hey, this is nefarious. They're trying to pervert the word of God. And so I, when someone says, well, John Rice didn't believe that. And people like Curtis Hudson in the beginning when he started preaching didn't believe that. Well, guess what? Brother Hudson got it right later in life because guess what? He eventually did the study. He said, wait a minute. This is wicked. This is evil. You and I have the benefit of sitting 100 years past that now having all the evidence that those guys didn't have. So I'm not going to let somebody say, well, you like John Rice, You like Curtis Hudson. They didn't believe it. Well, yeah, because they didn't have all the information. I have the information now. I have that and I... I now sit on their shoulders and know more than they did. Not smarter than they were, by any means. But I know more than they did because I have more information now. And that's important. Another issue a lot of these things have come up is because we've turned into a... Um, we're trying to change people's minds and a lot of times we don't stick to the truth. Oh, boy, I don't want to say that. We don't stick to the cold, hard facts all the time because it doesn't win an argument. You know, it, it's become popular. You know, we say whatever we want just to own the libs, right? If you're, if you're right wing or conservative, well, I'll, you just say what you want to own the libs. Well, the problem is that only goes so far. You know, we want to own the non-KJV people and we win an argument, but we're not always being entirely truthful in our position. Give you an example. This is going to, uh, some of you may not like this, but a lot of, you know, well, the Democrats are the real racists. You know, conservatives and Republicans say that all the time. They don't want to be labeled as racist or hateful, or they don't want to be labeled as hating women. So they go so far, well, you know, you know, the Democrats were the real racists back in the Civil War time. You know, the Democrats from the 50s and 60s, those were the real racists. Vote Republican because the Democrats were the real racists. Well, yeah, it, it's good for a bumper sticker. It's good for a slogan, it's good for a meme. The problem is it's not entirely honest because the Democrats early in the century were correct. The parties have switched. I don't care what anybody says, the parties have switched and now they're both garbage, all right? Republicans and Democrats are both garbage. But the Democrats back in the early on, you know, any Republican that, or any person, period, that opposes the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What, you, you think black people shouldn't have rights? No, you idiot. Obviously, I think they should have rights. But the problem with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that supposedly gave black people rights, they're using that same, and th there were people back in 1960s that opposed it, who were for blacks having rights, but they opposed the Civil Rights Act because it was a violation of the Constitution, and it was a violation of your rights to be stupid, ignorant, and whatever you want to be. They're using that law now to force a Christian to bake a cake for a sodomite. So back in the 60s, when some guy stood up and said, listen, I'll cut a black guy's hair, but I don't think you can force John Schmo down the street to do it. Now, it sounds bad when you say that, because like, well, who wouldn't cut a black guy's hair? Well, that law was put into effect, and that same law is now being used to force Christians to bake a cake for a sodomite. Or, or, or churches are losing their properties because they won't marry a homosexual couple. So what happened? You won the argument because you don't want to appear to be racist. It had nothing to do with race. I don't care. Black people should have the rights. I do. I've got no problem with that. But, well, here's the problem. I didn't want to appear racist. I didn't want to side with people that were more extreme than me because I didn't want to be clumped in with them. And we won the political argument, and now you've got a legislation piece that is forcing Christians to do abominable things under persecution of the law. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean I endorse everything. Because I side with somebody on a certain issue does not mean I agree with everything on that position. For instance, the KKK was in opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, if you come for any length of time, you know what we think about the KKK here, okay? They're an evil organization. We don't support them, right? But just because I may agree with them on one subject, doesn't mean I endorse everything that wicked organization endorses. Does that make sense? Same thing is true with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is a wicked, evil organization, but guess what? They're right on the Trinity. They're right on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I abhor everything else they teach, but just because I agree with the Trinity, and, and just because I agree with the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, doesn't mean I endorse everything they believe. And I'm not going to be pushed into a corner 
to where you're going to call me Catholic because I believe two Bible doctrines that the Catholic Church happens to believe. Just like I'm not going to be afraid of you calling me a racist because I believe two things or one or two things that some idiot on this side believes. Does that make sense? And that's important to discuss because what happened back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with the King James Bible issue is a lot of King James only people made the arguments, but they didn't want to be labeled with the extreme side. So they made the arguments that could win people over, but wasn't always intellectually honest, if that makes sense. It won people over, and if you believe the King James Bible is to be the Word of God, like Pastor says all the time, stay that way. Don't get smarter than that. But the problem is, if you don't understand the ins and outs of it, somebody may show you something, you're going to go, oh, wow. And now you're going to say, oh, everything this man taught me was a lie. Well, no, you're an idiot. Some of, them may be, some of them may have not known. Some of them may have willfully left it out. Some of them may have said what I say. You know what? They're not ready to hear that truth. I don't know the, what, the, what the reason each of them didn't do it was, but a lot of it has to do with, um, well, we'll get into it. All right, so that's my um, introduction. The first, the first um, we're running out of time. The first thing you have to understand, we're going to go over five things that people will criticize the King James only movement for. And these are more modern objections, right? And they, a lot of these have existed for a long time. The first thing they're going to do is say, well, it's mistranslated in certain places. The NIV translates it better. The ESV translates it better. And they'll take out, Now, I don't have time this morning to go through every single translational difference and say this is why. But I want to do an overview of giving you kind of an example. One of the busy, biggest examples people use is 1 John 5, 7 and 8, which is an important Bible document. I'll read it for you. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. In verse number eight, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, in the ESV, just to use an example, most, most uh, perversions say pretty close. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree. So they've taken out almost two-thirds of that whole passage and taken everything out about the Godhead. Now, the argument is, well, you know, we found older manuscripts that just didn't have it. Well, the King James used some obscure. We don't know where they got it from. It's not in the originals. All right? We're going to get into that. that. That's just a bunch of baloney. They say that, but just because something is older does not mean it's better. And we're, we'll get into that as well. Another big thing, and this is where I disagree, that one passage there, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, most independent fundamental Baptists agree. This next one I'm going to bring up to you, a lot of independent fundamental Baptists disagree. And the reason they disagree is because they don't want to be labeled with the extreme side. That's why. Acts 12, verse number 4, is the only passage in the entire Bible where the word Easter is mentioned. And now, if you're here at Easter... And, and if you're coming Wednesday night, this Wednesday night's pastor still going through his Bible study on the King James Bible. That's so important. Like I said, I, my objective this morning is not to prove to you the King James Bible is the Word of God. My objective is to deal with some of the modern things that they're going to throw out to you. Acts 12, uh, verse number 4. And when he had appre Herod had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternion of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring forth to the people. Now, the Greek word for that word Easter is Pascha or Passover, right? That word in the uh, Greek is mentioned 29 times in a Greek New Testament from which the King James Bible was translated. 28 out of the 29 times it was translated as Passover. And when you read your King James Bible, you just read Passover. In this one instance, it doesn't say Passover, it says Easter. Now, I've heard of several explanations for it, right? Um, obviously, if they're a King James only critic, they say, see, they mistranslated it wrong. Well, no, because I believe this is the final word of God. It's there for a reason. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and instead of questioning it and say, no, that's not it, I'm going to say, okay, why is it there? Because it's there for a reason. I know this is the word of God. Let's find out why God put it there. And when you take that perspective, you'll understand it a lot better. Now, a lot of independent Baptists will say, well, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It means the same thing as Passover. Well, then two things that are different can't be the same. So then the King James got it wrong. 
And they can say they're King James only, and they'll say, well, it means the same thing. Well, here's the problem. I don't have an every meaning Bible. I have an every word Bible. I have an every jot and tittle Bible. And it's important to understand that. Now, they'll go back and they'll say, well, uh, you know, the, the word, and this is partially true. They'll say, well, the, the word um, Easter didn't exist before then. And that's kind of partially true. All right, because, and we're not going to get into the derivatives where Easter came from. But even Passover didn't exist because Pascha, which Greeks still use to this day, Pascha is just a transliteration of the Hebrew word. So Passover was created, oh, an English word was created so that we could have it in the English and understand it. So they could have used Passover, just like they did 28 other times, but they decided not to. Now, we agree, and our church teaches, that obviously it's talking about a pagan holiday that Herod was in observance of. All right, now we all agree with that. You don't have to necessarily believe that to agree that the King James translators translated it correctly. Because if you go to verse number three, we won't get into it too, too deep, but if you go to verse number three, it says that after the, then were the days of unleavened bread. Well, unleavened bread happens after the Passover. The Passover is only one day, which I think the 14th of April, I think, or the fourth month, I believe. Um, and seven days after that is the days of unleavened bread. So based on this passage, just looking at it logically, it can't be Passover because Passover had already passed because the days of unleavened bread happened after the day of Passover. And so we know that that wasn't Passover. Amen. Now, we can sit here and say, what? And then what the, when you bring this up, say, what? Are you saying the Greek and the Hebrew was wrong? You can say what you want to say, but I know the King James is right. Amen. Because I know mathematically, Calendar-wise, it has to be correct, and every word in this has to be correct. Because if they were wrong in that one area, how can I trust any of it? Amen. The word Passover means something completely different than Easter. Amen. In any language, it means something completely different. So I have to say, okay, do I believe everything? Do I believe two things that are different cannot be the same? And so what happens is a lot of guys that believed this, rightfully, when they're confronted with this, well, I don't want to go to the extreme position of saying Easter's a pagan holiday. So what they end up saying is, well, it's the same thing. Well, it's not. You're just saying that because you don't want to get painted into that corner. Just like the Republicans 60 years ago didn't want to get painted into that corner, so they caved. Bible believers find themselves in the same exact spot. And it works to win someone over to your side. The majority of people, you'll win over that way. The problem is if you talk to somebody that knows, you're not winning. If you talk to someone who's actually intelligent enough to look at language and look at the, the originals or the Greek, they're going to go, you're lying. Or you're at least withholding information. The average Joe on the street, you're going to convince him of it because he doesn't know any better. And so for winning people over, I understand why it was done. The problem is someone who has more time and more willingness to learn looks into it deeper and goes, wait a minute, there's more there. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. Because I don't want to shake your faith in the King James, but I don't want someone to bring this up to you and you go, wait a minute. And then you're going to throw everything that they said down the drain when what they said was correct. They just left this part out because most people wouldn't understand it. Most people wouldn't be able to grasp it. Nine out of ten people would go way over their head and they'd end up more confused than if they had read it in the beginning. So first thing they'll say is, well, it's mistranslated. The King James Bible, they mistranslated it. 1600, they started the translation of the King James. There were about 50 to 60 translators. I think 54 translators. It took 11 years to translate. Amen. Now, you're going to tell me some idiot who took two years of Greek at Bible college is smarter than 55 of the world's smartest translators with all the resources they had at the time. I don't buy it. You know how to say the Greek alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You, you, and now you understand Greek and Hebrew. No, you don't. What you want to do is you want to criticize the Word of God. So you took two years where these guys spoke five, six, some of them ten different languages, enough, well enough to translate, and you think you can translate it better than they can. No, you're an idiot. You're, you, that's all it is. So the next thing they'll say is, all right, well, all right, so you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. They'll say, well, well, what about before the King James? If this is the Word of God, where was the King James before 1611? I'm telling you, they go to it all because they think, and again, they're not being sincere. If someone said this to you, I'm telling you right now, I don't care what they say, they're not being sincere. They're trying to play a gotcha game. And you're wasting your time to argue, but you need to understand it, that they're not right. 
They're not right, and I'm going to explain to you why. 2 Peter 1, verse 21, we read it before. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible was progressively being revealed to men on earth. Now, these, I'm going to be nice when I say this. I'm going to try and use a word that's not going to offend. But these idiots, when they say this, what they say, oh, well, where was, what, what Bible were, they didn't have the Bible before 1611? That's similar to saying that David didn't have the Bible because he didn't possess Malachi in his hand. No, he had the scriptures that God needed for him. He didn't have Malachi. That's like saying Jeremiah didn't have a Bible because he didn't have Matthew. Or Mark didn't have a Bible because he didn't have the book of Hebrews. Well, the Bible was progressively being given to men on earth, and they didn't have it possessed in one book. What they were doing is they, they had scrolls passed around, and this, this church would have the book of Deuteronomy for a little while, and this church would have the book of Exodus for a little while, and they'd pass around. That's why the danger of going to, well, well let's find out what the early church fathers said. Well, some of them were so far off on stuff, and I don't necessarily always hold it against them because they may not have had the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew may have been stuck in the church of Ephesus for 20 years, and they never had a chance to read it. So, of course, they were off on things. Well, guess what? I've got all of it now. Amen. I've got all of it combined into one possession, one thing. Now, the, the King James Bible is the seventh translation, the seventh English translation from the Greek and the Hebrew into English. There were predominantly, there's a few obscure ones, but the main ones, and if you know anything about the number seven in the Bible, it's the number of completion. Now this doesn't mean we base everything in our belief system off this, but it's one more proof that says, okay, this is, we're in the right direction here. You have the Tyndale Bible, which by the way, roughly account, in the New Testament, roughly accounts for about 80% of the King James Bible they took from Tyndale's Bible. Um, then you have the Matthews Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Gray Bible, the Geneva Bible, and then you have the Authorized Bible that came out in 1611. And what they'll say is, well, are you saying that I can't use the Geneva Bible and it's not the same thing? It's not. Now, that sounds bad to say because now what you're saying is, oh, someone who read the Geneva Bible didn't have what I have now. They don't. Now, that, that sounds mean. I know. You, and we want to, we've lived in a society where we've got to make everyone equal. And everyone, oh, you saying that this person doesn't have the same opportunities I have? They don't. Amen. You have more opportunities in some areas than I have, and I have some more opportunities in some areas that you don't have. Now, you could say that's mean or bigoted or rude to say, but it's the truth of what reality is. For instance, William Tyndale. William Tyndale, he translated the Bible and did a very good job, but the problem is it was one man. Luther translated the Bible. He didn't have the resources that the King James Bible translators had. It was one man. They took his work and he did a lot of good work. But what they did is when 50 of them got together, and you don't even have to believe in anything extra spiritual happening in 1611 to realize that it was just a magnificent work that happened, that the Bible was scattered all over the world. And until 1611, early 1500s, it started to come together. And in 1600, under King James, he had the power to bring all that material together and say, all right, put it in one book. And God used that. So guess what? Yes, now I have something that is better than what the people in 1550 had. I, I don't, I'm not mad at the people in 5050 because they didn't have a completed work. I'm not upset with them. I don't think they're less people. They're much better Christians than I am. I know that. But I have a better completed work. Does that make sense? And if you go to Jeremiah um, 36, where God destroyed the role, and Jeremiah added many like words to the second copy of it. So what was God doing? He was, he was refining the Word of God. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can mean it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that God did something extra spiritual, what's called what they derivatively, derivatively call um, double inspiration, where in 1611, God inspired and God worked miraculously, supernaturally in 1611. Now, I'm not going to get into whether I believe that or not this morning because it's irrelevant to this conversation. You can not believe that doctrine or you can believe it and still come to the conclusion that what happened in 1611 produced a far better product than what you had in 1590. Because just the actual work of it, just the actual physical evidence of it proves it. You don't need to even, you can go that way. And a lot of guys won't go, again, they won't go to this extreme because they don't want to be labeled with somebody that far to the on this position, not necessarily right or left, because it doesn't matter in this case. 
So the first thing they'll say, well, the King James Bible is mistranslated. And again, we go through the hundreds of instances, and it'll prove out every time that the King James Bible is right. Second thing they're going to say is, well, you know, where, what, what, where was the Bible before 1611? Well, it was being refined. It was being finally put together. They didn't have it. They, they, didn't, they didn't have the completed work. The next thing they'll say, and, it, it got, and a lot of these blend together, so they all work together. The next thing they'll say is, well, you know, the Greek disagrees with the English, and, and uh, the Greek is better. I'm going to go to the Greek. And there's a lot of independent fundamental Baptists that fall into this trap, that they'll go to the Greek for their beliefs. All right. The Greek text, and I've got a lot of, um, this is a Greek interlinear text, parallel text. It's got the Greek text, the Amplified Bible, the King James Bible, the Rhymes Bible, the New American Standard. And I can open it here, and I can find there's six different, no, eight different translations right there, right? And along with the Greek. So what a lot of pa pastors will do is they'll pick up something like this, or they'll have four or five different translations, and they'll read whichever one they want to read that fits their doctrine and what they want to teach for that Sunday. And guess what? If none of them work, they can go back to the Greek and say, well, I'm going to side with the Greek on this one. Here's the problem. None of these agree with each other, including the Greek and the, the English. They don't always agree. And as we discovered from Acts 12.4, that's okay. That doesn't shake my faith in the King James because the King James has a different reading of Acts 12.4. It strengthens it. It proves it more to me. All right? And they're going to try and shake your faith in it as opposed to the other way. It should strengthen your faith in it. We've got to move. I'm running out of time. But you have in the Greek text, here's the problem with the people that go to the Greek. The first accumulation of Greek texts that were put together in a text was Erasmus in 1516. Erasmus took all the Greek different manuscripts that were existent and he put them together in one volume, what's called a text. Right? Now here's the thing, if you go to Erasmus' Greek text, he had five different editions. So the first time he wrote it, after a little while, he said, well, let me update it here, because I think this is more accurate, as he gathered more information. Next time it was done by um, Erasmus, or uh, Stephanus, excuse me, he had three editions. Beza had three editions. Elzevir had ten editions. So you've got several editions of the Greek New Testament, 15 to 20 of them, that don't agree with one another. So some, and again, I'm going to be nice when I say this, I want to use a word that's not going to offend, but these idiots, what they say is, well, I'm going to go to the Greek. Well, which Greek are you going to go to? There's 20 of them. There's 30 of them. Now, guess what? The, the King James translators, when they translated the 1611 edition, guess what? They had all of them at their disposal. So what you've got, some Greek scholar who took two years of Bible college, thinks he's smart. He goes, well, I'm going to go to the Greek. Well, which one are you going to? You had 50, 50 translators went to 20 different editions and weighed which one would be the right one. And some idiot picks up one of them and goes, yup, this is the one. I know this is it. No, you're, you're, you're stupid. So what, what people don't want to say, the King James is better than the Greek and the Hebrew. No, I'm not slandering the Greek and the Hebrew. What I'm saying is, which Greek or Hebrew are you going to go to? What happened, there were so many of them around the face of the earth at 1611, 1600 to 1611, God put it all together and chose the smartest men in the world to say, well, listen, 95 of them say this, and 5% of them say this, it's probably this. That's common sense. Well, the problem is when you don't know, for instance, here's a Greek in a linear New Testament. If you go to the beginning, some of them say it. This one says, this is from Stephanus, 1550, and Elzevir, 1624. Well, that, at least he puts it in there. What about the other 18 editions? How do I, guess what? I don't know which one the King James translators used. So I either have to say there's room for error in the King James, which I'm not going to say. Or I have to say, you know what? God worked marvelously, and what they chose was correct. Whatever they chose in that room at Hampton Court, that's God's word. Instead of me sitting here going, well, let me look at all 27 editions of the Greek and not knowing which one it is. Here I've got another one. Inter interlinear Bible. Most people will use this. This is um, Scrivener's. What Scrivener did in the 1800s, notice the date there, 1800, 1880, I think, 81 maybe. What he did is he took most of the Greek texts that were used, the ones I mentioned, and he pretty much combined them into one. And while he was doing it, he put in bold and noted the differences between that and the King James. And he used the King James when he wasn't sure of a reading, he consulted with the King James. So this Greek New Testament, this is Hebrew as well, but well, just for the sake of argument, for the Greek, what he did is he took 
the, the Greek, the original, if you want to call it that, he consulted all of them, or many of them, and he consulted the King James. So the Greek test, New Testament you have now, 1880, when it came out, is now 300 years newer than the King James. And he consulted the King James when he compiled it. So you've got, again, I'm, I'm trying to be nice when I say this, and I don't want to offend anybody, but these idiots say, well, I'm going to go back to the Greek. Well, well, smarty pants, this is 300 years newer than this. So I'm really going back to the originals. You're not. You're going to, I'm, I'm not faulting this, right? That's, you want to use it as a tool, whatever your reasons are for going back to this, more power to you. I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to the King James, because guess what? This came 300 years after, and I don't know which one the King James translators used. Does that make sense this morning? I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying the, 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 uh, not to, the Greek and the Hebrew can't be used. But I'm an English speaker. I'm going to go to the English because I know that is a more completed work than 15, 20 different Greek translations. So when these idiots say, well, well, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm, well, a lot of them will say, well, I'm a TR guy. And a lot of independent Baptists Baptist put this on their website. We believe in the Texas Receptus, as do I. But which text is Receptus? And they wave their Bible in the air that's 300 years newer than my Bible. And then they tell me I'm wrong. Well, mine came out in 1611. Yours came out in 1881. Do you understand the problem here? And that's why you always beware of somebody that says, well, in the Greek it says this, and in the Hebrew it says that. Well, which one? You get to pick and choose which one it is. And then there's independent fundamental Baptists. Love them dearly. They claim they're King James only, but they'll sit there and say, well, the Greek is the same as the English. It reads exactly the same. Well, not if every jot and tittle matters. And if it was the same, why did Scrivener in 1880 notify the differences because even when he knew it, I'm not saying Scrivener was good in everything, but even he noticed differences. He goes, wait a minute, there's differences between the King James. And when you make the argument, and again, you're trying to prove the King James Bible is the Word of God, you say it's the same as the Greek and the Hebrew. And it wins an argument, but the problem is somebody who does enough research eventually finds out that's not true. And you win 9 out of 10 people, but that 1 out of 10 people goes, wait a minute, that's not right. And for the majority of people, it works. Yes, it's exactly the same. It's not exactly the same. And guess what? Two things that are different cannot be the same. If the Greek differs from the English in one area, one has to be more accurate than the other. It has to be. And, and, and the fundamental Baptists will say it all day long. Oh, they're the same thing. They're not. The, they cannot be the same thing. To give you an example. No, oh, we are running out of time. Another thing we do a lot is we say, oh, you know, the... Uh, there's two lines of manuscripts, the Alexandrian text and the, and the um, Antioch text, which is what the King James comes from, the Texas Receptus. When truth of what it is, and there is two lines of manuscripts, there's only two, and to give you an illustration, there are two manuscripts, because I don't have enough paper to properly illustrate this, I'm going to take two pieces of paper and put it here. There are two manuscripts that all translations of the Bible, and I use that in quotes, Except the King James come from. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus come from this book here. From these two here. And they say these are the oldest. Well the problem is they're the oldest because no one paid attention to them. They were found in garbage cans and it doesn't matter. What our Bible comes from, we say, we say it's two lines. And that's true, it's two lines. And we say that to win an argument. Here's the truth of the matter. That's the Texas Receptus. There's two against, that's about 300 pages. And that's not historically accurate. So let's add another one. This is all the historical evidence supporting the King James Bible. And here's the problem. I ran out of paper at home. I only had about 4,500 pages of paper at home. When the King James Bible translators translated the Bible, they had over 5,300 different manuscripts, texts, or supporting documents for the King James Bible. Your NIV has two. Your New King James Bible has two. Your RSV has two. So when we argue with someone, we say, well, you know, it's two lines of, two lines of text. That's true. But it's not 50-50 here. It's 5,300, roughly, to two. And these are garbage. They're not worth using. They're literal toilet paper. Even if they were reliable. Let's just go with that, because that's what they say. 
it's still 5,300 to two. You have to understand that. All right, moving along quickly. The next thing we'll say is, well, what about the English and other languages? What about the Bible and other languages? What, are you saying that, you know, Filipinos can't have a Bible, it's only the English? Well, part of that is true, and here's why. In order to translate the Bible into a language, there have to be enough words in that language to translate it. Some languages, because of the place of the earth they are, don't have a, a word for the word lamb. They don't have sheep in their country. So now when I translate the Bible to that language, I've got to come up with a word for the word lamb, which is a pretty important Bible word. And so what I'm doing is, those people when they read that will not have a full understanding of the, what a lamb is, and I'm just using that as an example, when it's much easier in today's society, because everybody speaks English, to go to the King James. And so what people want to do is say, well, you know, you can't tell people they can't have the Bible, and we're all equal, all languages are not equal. God, I believe God used the English language to be a standard for the world. Zephaniah, or Zephaniah 3 9 says, For then I will turn to the people a pure language, that they shall all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And I believe God used the English language to spread the gospel through the world. And when a lot of people, what they want to do, they'll take one or two guys to translate the Bible into, let's just say, I don't know, pick Filipino or whatever, whatever language you want to choose. The problem is they don't have the work of 5,300 documents, 50 of the world's best translators translating it. What they take is one document from over here that they don't even know if that's even 100% accurate. So that's why I say this is the word of God. This is the completed work. I'm not against other translations into other languages, but it must always line up with this. If there's any uh, discrepancy with this, this is right and that is wrong. It has to, because this is the work that was completed. This is the work that was put into effect. All this went into that. The last thing, and I, I feel bad because we don't have enough time, but the, the last thing is they'll say, which edition of the King James do you use? Now here at Grace Baptist Church, we use the 1900 edition. I think Pastor briefly went over this the other night in the, in, uh, the Bible study on Wednesday nights. The pure Cambridge edition. And what the problem is, for a long time, a lot of people have said, well, you know, all the editions of the King James are the same. And that's not necessarily true. Now, they're very close. They are very, very close, but they are not the same. And guess what? If I'm going to go back to my book from before, that two things that are different cannot be the same, that means I have to follow that all the way through. King James only people will take John 1.1 1, 1 and say, it's his, the perversion says, a God, our Bible says God. And that changes a lot. One um, one definite article, one letter changes the meaning. Well, guess what? I've got to follow it all the way through to say, you know what? Every single, every single word, letter matters. That's why I side with the 1900 Pure Cambridge Edition. And most, most guys say, well, what you really have is a 1769 edition. And most of them just don't know what they're talking about because that's just not true. They say a guy named Blaney did it. He made a lot of mistakes. Most of the Bibles that people have today, modern editions of the Bible, actually are closer to 1611 than they are the Blaney 1769. But they just say, and again, these are not genuine people who are making these arguments. They just hear catchphrases and they're play, trying to play gotcha. They just don't know. And they're trying, don't argue, it's pointless arguing with them because they just don't know the facts. But you have to understand that, guess what? There are differences between the editions and the King James. And you ought to do the homework for yourself and find out which one you're going to use and which one is correct. Give you an example and then we'll, we'll finish with this. Um, if you go to Luke chapter number 16, or Luke 23, verse 32. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke here. I am late. This is what I was afraid of. It's a good thing I had to write down everything I wanted to say today. Luke 23, verse 32. Two commas make a huge difference. Luke 23, verse 32. The Bible says, and there were also two other malefactors, two other comma, malefactors, comma, led with him to be put to death. That's talking about Jesus. Now, if I take the 1611 edition, and independent fundamental Baptists hate this because they won't do it, but if I take this 1611 edition, which is a photocopy of 1611, right, and I read that same verse, it takes out those two commas. The problem is when you take out the two commas, it makes Jesus a malefactor, which is a criminal. It would say this, and there were also two other malefactors, Meaning Jesus was a malefactor. Well, guess what? It doesn't mean that the King James of 1611 was a false perversion. 
Okay, I'm not saying that. But guess what? It was refined. It was in the refining process, just like gold goes into a furnace and it becomes refined. That was in 1611. If you have a 1611, that's, I have friends of mine that use a 1611 edition of the Bible. I tell them all the time, don't use it. It's, I have one for historical purposes, whatever, and you can research. But this is more refined because guess what? It needs two commas there. You go a little further, in 16, well, I think 31 it was, Barker, who printed the original 1611 King James, got fired by the king and fined. He ended up dying in prison in debt because of it. Because when he printed, I think 1631, instead of putting thou shalt not commit adultery, he printed thou shalt commit adultery. And it's called what's called the Wicked Bible. Well, that was one of the editions of the King James. So when somebody says, well, all the editions are the same, they're not. Now, they're close. I'm not going to lie to you. They are pretty close. But guess what? I, I, I don't want to not say something because I don't want to be painted in a corner because you're going to accuse me of being aligned with somebody else. I don't care what you call me. You can call me whatever name you want to call me. I'm going to stand on truth. And it's important for you to understand that. Say, listen, my faith is not shaken in the Word of God. It's more secure. And when someone throws out one of these idiotic arguments to you, you should be able to, like I said, don't argue with them. It's pointless. They're, they're, they don't want to be convinced. They just want to argue and question the Word of God. But you ought to know enough to say, you know what, wait a minute. I know the truth. That can be easily dispelled. But these guys that don't want to do their homework, when they hear this, like, oh, man, I never knew that. Well, that's because you didn't want to do the research. It's because you didn't want to do the homework. Or they'll make an argument, oh, it's all the same. It works for 9 out of 10 people. But you get that one smart person who goes, no, they're lying. No, they're withholding something back. You've got to be careful. The King James Bible is the Word of God. Like I said, this wasn't a sermon to convince you of it. This was a sermon to dispel some of the modern things. Because these things weren't brought up 20, 30 years ago. I see guys now coming out, Independent Fundamental Baptists and others, modernly trying to push this garbage, and we need to know what is true and what is not. All right, let's, we're late. Everybody about every act closed. Dear Lord, I pray this was a help this morning. I pray that you help us to understand that um, the King James Bible is the Word of God. Lord, and I hope that it was a help. I don't want to confuse anybody this morning. I don't want to add doubt to somebody's mind. Lord, I want to, I want to solidify the Word of God and prove further that the King James Bible is what you say it is, the eternal Word of God. In your name we pray. Amen.